a first in television history, I guess we could say, because never before have these two pillars of economic thought faced off on live television. It is time for what we're calling Paul versus Paul. On the one side, Representative Ron Paul has been a pioneer of fiscal conservatism, the face of debt reduction and small government, a hero to the Tea Party. And far on the other side of the spectrum, our guest host, Professor Paul Krugman, a spokesman for activist government, a believer in deficit spending, and this generation's voice for economic liberalism. Gentlemen, welcome. We want to get right to the core here of your disagreement. Agreement. We're going to begin with Congressman Paul. Representative Paul, you know where Professor Krugman stands. What would you say is wrong or what would you disagree with in terms of his view of government? Well, he believes in big government from what I read and hear, and I believe in very small government. I emphasize personal liberties. I don't like a managed economy, whether it's through central economic planning or monetary policy or, or even Congress doing it. So it's a completely different uh, philosophy that markets are supposed to work, uh, you know, in a natural way. I want a natural rate of interest. I don't want the government or the Federal Reserve fixing the rate of interest. That's a price fixing. And wage and price controls never work, so pricing the cost of money uh, doesn't work either. And this idea that somebody or some group might know what the proper amount of money should be or what the proper rate of interest should be is sort of presumptuous. You know, I don't, I don't know where they get this knowledge. And uh, hi, I call it the pretense of knowledge. They pretend they know, but they really don't. So when we talk about electing a president or a Congress to run the economy better, they're missing the whole point. Okay. Uh, governments aren't supposed to run the economy. The people are supposed to run the economy. Well, well, what's wrong, uh, Professor? Krugman right. with leaving the government out of the equation. Well, there's certain things, you know, you can't leave the government out of monetary policy. If you try to think, you know, we're, we're going to just let it set itself, it doesn't happen. The government is actually always, uh, the, the Federal Reserve, the central bank is always going to be in the business of managing uh, monetary policy. If you think that that, you can avoid that, um, you're living in some, you're living in the world as it was 150 years ago, right? We have a, an economy in which money is not just green pieces of paper. With, uh, with faces of dead presidents on them. Money is, is, uh, is the result of the financial system. It includes a variety of assets. We're not even quite sure where the line between money and non-money is. It's kind of a, a continuum. And look, history tells us that, in fact, an un, a completely unmanaged economy is subject to extreme volatility, subject to extreme downturns. I know there's this legend that people like, uh, probably you, Congressman, have that the Great Depression was somehow caused by the government, caused by the Federal Reserve, but it's not true. The reality is that was a market economy run amok, which happens, happened repeatedly over, our, over the past couple of centuries. You do need, you know, I, I'm actually, I'm a believer in the market economy. I'm a believer in capitalism. I want the market economy to be left as free as it can be, but there are limits. You do need the government to step in to stabilize. Depressions are a bad thing for capitalism, and it's the role of the government to make sure that they don't happen, or if they do happen, that they don't last too long. Congressman Paul, you know, we've been talking a lot about inflation here on the set today, um, and it's a, it's a policy that Professor Krugman is really saying that the Fed should put forward. In other words, we need a little inflation in this economy to get things going. What do you say to that? Well, inflation is theft. You're stealing value from people who save money. So if you have a 2% or a 10%, the value of the currency is lost. And it really destroys an important feature of the economy, and, and that is savings. Savings tells us something, and it tells us if capital is available. This notion that capital can come out of the expansion of the money supply is remote. Now, uh, Professor Krugman indicates that we just want to go back to 100 years or so. That is not exactly true. We'd like to improve on what was like back then, but he wants to go back a thousand years or two thousand years, just as the Romans and the Greeks and all other countries debased their currency. They didn't have a computer. This idea that we need a Federal Reserve to run things, well, federal uh, uh, or a central bank, that's just a modern era. Now, now and, uh, Representative it's Paul, never, it's, can you clarify what do you mean by go back a thousand years? Is is, is that fair? Clarify well, what, what uh, you mean what, by that. What, uh, yeah. 
what did, what did the Romans do to their currency? Uh, the, the, the Benzantine Empire had a gold standard for a thousand years, and they did quite well, and they didn't fight wars. But the Roman Empire eventually destroyed their currency. They put a wage and price controls before they diluted the metals, they inflated, they thought wealth could come by fooling the people. Who would want today, if they had, if they had 10 years to send their kid to college, would they put their money in gold coins or a treasury bill making one or two percent? They can't keep up with the inflation or the devaluation of the currency. There would be nothing there. Right. Nobody puts I didn't, their money I didn't think in a that 10 year bond. Okay. That be, I, I am not a defender of the economic policies of the Emperor Diocletian. So let, let's just make that clear. No, the, the, well, the, you the, are. In a way, you are. No, That's I'm, exactly I'm a, what you're defending. I'm a defender <laughs> of the economic policies that we followed after World War II that produced this, the, best dec, the best generation of economic growth that this country has ever experienced. We had a, a set of policies that provided, there was mild inflation, there was government, effective government regulation of the financial system so that it didn't go wild the way it did after we lifted those regulations. We had fiscal policy that stimulated the economy when it was needed. Um, we had policies that fostered a strong middle class instead of, uh, instead of using the, the, the worship of, of the supposedly ideal forces right. of the market okay. to, to lead to plutocracy. I, I, li I like the America that my parents prospered in. I think yeah, we can there, restore there, a lot of that. Reason. And there are some reasons for that. Just remember that Friedman, uh, you know, uh, Bernanke apologized to Friedman because the Federal Reserve was responsible for prolonging the agony of the Depression. You have to liquidate the debt. After World War II, a lot of the debt was liquidated. But guess what else we did? The troops were coming home. Ten million people came home. Big government liberals wanted to have job programs. They weren't put in the place. We cut spending by some 60 percent. We slashed taxes. Finally, the Depression ended. That's so. Uh, uh, yes, there were some history. things, but it was, the liquid, it was the liquidation of debt that made it available that we could go wanna, back to work again. I want to say something about Milton Friedman here, because if you actually read what he wrote in his writings for economists, as opposed to some of his slightly loose popular writings, he actually said that the Federal Reserve was responsible for the Great Depression because it didn't do enough. Friedman's complaint was that the Federal Reserve did not print a, enough money. Now, I, 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 you know, I know this really. When, when Ben Bernanke talked about the helicopter, that was, he was taking that metaphor from Milton Friedman. That wasn't his idea. And, and, well, when see, and it, it, it's the, really telling that in the state of America right now, Milton Friedman would count as being on the far left of the debate over monetary policy. Yeah. That's something terribly but wrong point, with the way we've gone the, here. The point the point is, the Fed either does too much or too little, and they can't do it. So they don't have a very good record. They've ruined 98 percent of the value of the currency since 1913. And that's dishonest. That steals value from people. Why should people get 1 percent for the money for savings, and the banks get it for practically free, and they make money? Why did, why did the Federal that's Reserve bail out the rich? Why didn't they give the money to the mortgage holders? If you care about poor people, so Representative people Paul, houses, would... why didn't you use helicopters? Why didn't you use <laughs> and pass it out well, to the home, home okay. builders. That would have been more fair. Well, what is your it? prescription then for what should the Fed do? I mean, should we not have a Federal Reserve? I mean, what, what should the role of the, the Fed be? You talked about Milton Friedman. He said, hey, why not replace the Fed with a computer? Um, what right. is it going to come to? I'm with him. You're well, I, I tell you what. I tell you what we uh, what we could do, and even with my book and the Fed, if you read it, it doesn't call for the end of the Fed because it would be chaotic if tomorrow we ended the Fed. Too many people dependent. But all I want to do is get rid of the monopoly. I want to legalize competition. There's legal competition on currencies around the world. Why can't we allow ourselves here the legal competition over gold or silver standard? Uh, wh why was the Fed so frightened about this? And then, if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, whew, I have uh, no uh, idea who, what that's about. Who cares? If I'm right, if I'm right, if the, if you want the paper money uh, and I'm wrong, it doesn't hurt anybody. Just allow me to legalize the currency, get rid of the monopoly, take the taxes off gold and silver, and get rid of the sales tax and capital gains tax and get in the legal tender laws. Don't hide behind a monopoly and force. See, people today, if they use gold and silver, you can really, go to jail in this country. Do you really country. think that people... That's not, what I, that's not my understanding of the law. But do you really think that people use dollar bills only because the federal government isn't allowing them to use other stuff? That, that seems to me to be a very strange point of view. And by the way, we have lots well, you of don't private have a choice. money. You go to jail if you use anything else. You go that's to jail. Not what I've heard. You can do barter. You can do barter with all kinds of stuff. No, the fact of the matter is that, that we actually have. We actually had too much, too much currency competition, too much money competition, right? This crisis was brought on by an expansion of what amounted to private money in the form of things like repo.
which were uncontrolled and turned into a, a, an enormous crisis when they collapsed. So, but look, okay. I mean, so if, come back if to a that. private company, if a co private company commits fraud, they go to jail. If the Federal Reserve commits fraud, they get nothing. I mean, the you Federal can do Reserve? whatever you want. So the Federal, if the private, if you had private issue of money and you committed fraud, you you would go to jail well, for that. Well, if you think that but no, governments can debase a currency and injure a lot of people, cause the business cycle, cause the inflation, cause the unemployment, and they get off scot free. I, so I've been pretty harsh on my our understanding. I've been pretty harsh on Ben Bernanke, but fraud is not one of the things I would charge him with. <laughs> well, Dr. Yeah. Krugman, if, if you, we you, can... you, want him, you want him to free, print more money faster. Believe well, me, of course it doesn't do. work. We have enough evidence for that. So, Dr. Krugman, let's try to, and we, we, were we touched on this earlier, but if we can try to put a number on it. Debt here in this country is a percentage of GDP. Right now, about 100% if you add in... Right, state and local. The, the, yeah, state and local plus Social Security. How much higher could we go? And, and then we start to put a number on How much higher could we go? And then I want to ask uh, uh, your counterpart, uh, Representative Paul, the same question. All right. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't have a fixed number, but if it takes another 30 points to get us out of this depression, then I'm willing to accept that. I won't claim that there's no risk, but the risk of not doing what it takes to get out of the depression is, is a clear and present danger. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't want us to go off to Japanese levels of debt, even though they turn out to be able to carry those levels of debt. But, but we, are, we are not anywhere close to a red line here, is the point. I, don't, I can't give you a specific number, but it's, we're not anywhere close to a red line. But 130%? As you just Britain, cited, 30% Britain, Britain, Britain was, 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 you know, when John Maynard Keynes was writing, Britain had, had debt that was on the order of 130% of GDP. That didn't stop fiscal stimulus from actually being the answer. The main point is that trying, trying to reduce that number by slashing spending now actually makes even the debt problem worse. It, it's one thing to say, oh, I don't like that level of debt, but if you're going to say, and my, my proposal is to actually destroy the economy so that we can't, in fact, or, afford to, to carry the debt we already have, that's not, a, that's not a helpful policy. Representative Paul, your response? Well, uh, he, he just ignores the fact that we did better after World War II when we did reduce the debt and the spending. But no, and one thing I can't agree with him is we don't know the precise date. We don't know whether it's 110, 130, it could be tomorrow on some other event because there is a uh, subjective factor involved. And we are sort of given a leeway because the world still trusts our dollar. I agree with him. But that just means it's a bigger bubble for our bonds and our dollar. So we don't know. But if this were true, America, as long as the, if you believe that the world will continue to take, take our dollars, no matter what our debt is, Americans shouldn't have to work anymore because we just print, print all the money. But yeah. the worst part about all this is the facilitation of debt because the Fed is the lender of a resort, not only to their friends on Wall Street and all their banker friends, but also to the politicians who get reelected by running up these debts. And the Fed always is there. They have to be there. So there's no restraints on, on the uh, Congress to run up debt. So if you love big government and think it can last forever, no, I can understand why you'd love the Fed, but some of us believe in freedom and markets and sound right. money. And I believe in freedom and markets. And no I just more, don't and believe no in. More, and no more I don't wars. believe in, in monetary <laughs> policies to perpetuate depression. U.S. debt. Thank you. Fast approaching 16 trillion dollars. Unemployment still above 8 percent. When you look at the universe right now, what do you see as the bigger threat? Is it unemployment, or is it our debt levels? I don't think you can separate them, but if you want the one number, I think it's the debt uh, that does it because it's a, a cause of unemployment because all the money is going into government, government spending and paying for the debt. So therefore it comes out of the marketplace and that causes the unemployment. But I think it's a lot, the unemployment is a lot worse than 8% because even the, even the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, when they report the people who don't look for work any longer, it's much higher. So we are in a very serious crisis, but it's big government, big spending, like I mentioned earlier, it's this idea that the Fed is always there and can put, bail the politicians out, and they are the lender resort, of last resort for the politicians and uh, all the big banks and all the all the things that they do in this uh, in this uh, atmosphere that we have today. Well, you know, theoretically, if companies and corporations thought that the Fed was always going to be there to bail them out and that things could always be good, they might actually be willing to take on a little bit more risk. But we're in an environment right now where CEO after CEO will come on this program and say, you know, they're not feeling confident enough about the future and they're not feeling confident enough about the rules that will be in place in the future to actually go out and hire. 
Well, I think where the real damage being done right now are the politicians. They talk about deficits, and you know, there are about 12 of us that started off in the Republican primary. Nobody else offered a real cut. I think it's so serious, I offered a trillion dollar uh, cut in one, one year. Mm -hmm. So it's the government that knows the lender of last resort there will always buy these treasury bills, will always keep interest rates lower than the market. If, if the politicians knew interest rates would go bumped up if they start hogging up all the credit, they would have to quit. They wouldn't be able to finance the wars. They wouldn't be able to find this runaway welfare. that have so to in other hold words, back. the Fed's to blame. But politically, politically, it's almost impossible for them to accept that. The Excuse Fed, me? then, you think, is to blame for, for basically these, these huge debt levels because low interest rates means, you know, it enables Washington to continue spending? They're, they're an accomplice. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's everybody. The people have an appetite for big government. I mean, uh, in the Republican primary, they want you to go into, uh, into Iran, and they want you to go in, into Syria and all these places, even more so than Obama. But the people still have an appetite for welfare, enough for the politicians not to want to cut, cut back. So the people have the appetite. The politicians love to wield power and influence, and that's how they can raise money. And also the Fed is there to accommodate. It doesn't have to come out of savings. But this is where the distortions come from. And you can get away with this for a while. And, and really the breakdown of the system occurred in 1971. And we've been able to get out of the recessions by spending more and printing Are you talking about the gold standard? More. <laughs> yeah, I want to get to gold in a the second. Last link, Can, but, the but last first, link to gold. <laughs> and I, I want to go there for sure. But first, let me ask you, because you're saying we need to cut all this spending. Otherwise, we're going to have a huge hangover that generations for after generations are going to have to deal with. So suppose we do. How do we prevent ourselves from becoming, say, the next Spain? I mean, you look at the austerity measures that they've put in place in Europe after years of spending. Now the austerity is just not working. In fact, it's digging them deeper into trouble. How do we prevent but, becoming Europe? Well, if you only do the austerity and you don't correct the other problems, then they're probably a little bit further in Europe, a little bit further along in their socialistic welfare programs than we are. So just cutting the spending, if you didn't deal with the tax code and the regulatory code and the, and the Federal Reserve, yeah, uh, it's going to be difficult. So it is a major, major task. This is why... Uh, I want to see something in place and something come competing with the Federal Reserve because one day it'll come when the dollar will be deserted. There's no reason in the world for, why, for the world to cling to dollars and use the dollar. Already the other nations are talking about another reserve currency and there's a lot of talk that the countries that got in the most trouble in the Middle East are the ones who didn't want to use dollars anymore and they're talking about even selling and buying gold. Now that we put sanctions on Iran, they're talking about buying and selling oil in gold. So one of these days that's going to happen and there will be a rush out of the dollar, interest rates will go up and this thing will end. And I know you want to peg the U.S. dollar to gold, correct? I want the market to decide exactly what to do, but yes, uh, that constitution still says the dollar should be pegged to gold and or silver, and so that would be better. That would restrain, unless you love big government, if they want the wars and the welfare state, it would put, uh, it puts a damage on it. But that'll it all come to an end. It basically limits what the Fed can do, right? I mean, you can't have as much flexibility on, on, on policy if you've, if you've got your dollar tied to gold. Well, that's exactly what the purpose is. You, you don't want the flexibility. You want the market to send the indicators because people at the Fed aren't smart enough to know what the supply of money should be. Oh, last week we just created 25 billion new dollars. And, you know, the interest rate should be 1% instead of 3% because we are so smart. And this will, uh, and because of this confusion, that's one of the reasons the businessman, once the confidence is lost, he doesn't, it, it's much better for the banks to get money for free and, and, yeah. and loaning it back to the government. At three percent. Well, if so we they have, have no a, incentive to. <laughs> Representative Paul, if we have a Bretton Woods 2.0 summit, will you join us? <laughs> well, sure, I, okay. I would join it. But so Bre Bretton Woods was hardly Bre so Bretton Woods was hardly the answer because it was <laughs> destined to fail. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I've got you on record for that. But then finally, let me just ask you. Okay. I mean, you've been a voice of, of fiscal conservatism in this race. How much longer do you anticipate staying in? Till the votes are counted. 
until the votes are counted. And if the I mean, votes I mean, are counted, right now, just, uh, just look at this last week and all this happened at these states. I mean, the news are very favorable to us. I mean, we could even end up winning Iowa, ironically enough. And uh, many in Minnesota were doing well in Maine and Washington, state of Washington and, and, and Nevada and Missouri. We're doing very, very well. Some of the states we could well win or come up very much because the delegates process is completely different than these uh, uh, these straw votes that have been going on. So we're, we're, we're pleased and, the, and they're on the process. It's got another month or so till they count all the delegates and find out exactly where we stand. And you'll be there until they count the delegates? Sure. Okay. And if the delegates are counted and it turns out that Governor Romney is nominated, will you support him? Oh, it probably depends a lot of uh, ideas on uh, who, what, what his platform is going to be. If, if every single thing he has in the platform I disagree with, it's going to be tough. You know, what, what, if, uh, what if it's 100% opposite of everything I've said on civil liberties, on the war issues, on spending cuts, on monetary policy? You know, what do I, what can I do? I, I mean, we have millions of people now supporting our campaign, and the millions haven't been heard from because they're independents and they're Democrats because they're unhappy with Obama. Okay. So to support somebody that have, might have 100% opposite views on mine, uh, it would be difficult. Okay. Hopefully he sticks to his guns about not raising taxes. Okay, so still up in the air as to whether you will support Governor Romney, but you are sticking at it until all the votes are counted. Our thanks to you, GOP presidential candidate and Texas congressman. Ron Paul.